Welcome to the Frequentist Interpretation of Probability, a video lesson in probability and statistics. An alternative to the classical interpretation of probability, known as the Frequentist Interpretation, was introduced by Robert Ellis and Antoine Augustine Cournot. However, the Frequentist Interpretation was formalized in a rigorous way by John Venn. Frequentist interpretation of probability is useful in its own right as a means of computing or at least estimating probabilities of outcomes within a system. However, we'll also see that it's a key concept for understanding certain techniques of parameter estimation, which will be our primary tool for fitting probability models to the data that we collect. We'll introduce the frequentist interpretation of probability through its formal definition. Consider an experiment in which a process unfolds n times. Suppose also that during this process, a preferred outcome might or might not happen during each observation. If this preferred outcome occurs in R of the n observations, then the relative frequency of that outcome is given by R over n. Typically, we denote relative frequency with a capital R. Moreover, the frequentist probability is then taken to be the limit, if it exists, of the relative frequency as n grows to infinity. We'll illustrate relative frequency and then later frequentist probability through some examples. So we imagine a pollster who surveys a focus group of 12 customers of a car dealership regarding their satisfaction with the customer service they received during the previous year. Out of the group, three responded that they were dissatisfied, and the rest claimed to be satisfied. The relative frequency of dissatisfied customers in the focus group is 3 over 12, or 25 percent. Similarly, there were nine customers who were satisfied, and the relative frequency that a customer from the focus group will be satisfied is given by 9 over 12, or 75 percent. Therefore, the relative frequencies from this focus group suggest a customer satisfaction probability of about 75%. However, the pollster has looked at only a single relatively small focus group, so this is pretty far from conclusive. Relative frequency can be a useful estimate for the frequentist probability of an outcome. However, how, how can we know how many observations we need to make in order to obtain an accurate estimate? So this next example sheds some light on that question. As the customer base for the car dealership grows over time, the pollster is asked to survey focus groups of increasing sizes in order to determine the relative frequency of dissatisfied customers and satisfied customers. The data they accumulate over time is summarized in a table. There, N represents the group size R represents the number of dissatisfied customers, and N minus R represents the number of satisfied customers. So we could see that our table is actually organized into five columns. The first three represent the size of the survey, the number of dissatisfied customers within that survey, and the number of satisfied customers within that survey. And then the remaining two columns represent the relative frequencies of dissatisfied and satisfied customers for each survey. So the pollster notices, and you might too if you go back and review the data, that as n, or the survey size, increases, the relative frequencies seem to trend towards the somewhat stable values of about 0.18 or 0.19 for dissatisfied customers and 0.81 or 0.82 for satisfied customers. He summarizes the data in a graph and displays these relative frequencies as a function of focus group size. These trends are a little easier to detect on graphs. If we actually look at the graph, we can see that the blue trace represents the relative frequency of the dissatisfied customers and it does tend to level off somewhere around 0.18 or 0.19 as anticipated. And similarly, the orange trace represents the relative frequency of the satisfied customers, and it does tend to level off around 0 0.82, 0 0.81. And so these limiting values ultimately represent what we would consider to be an approximation 
to the frequentist um, probabilities. The pollster recognizes the same thing. So after analyzing the data in the graph, the pollster concludes that there is a limiting value that each of the relative frequencies seem to be approaching as the focus group sizes increase. Therefore, he uses the values of 0.19 and 0.81 to estimate the frequentist probabilities that a customer will either be dissatisfied or satisfied. The lesson here is that it, if it's possible to make several sets of observations increasing in size and then count the number of preferred outcomes you see in each of these sets, then the relative frequencies can provide an estimate of the frequentist probability of that outcome if they appear to be approaching a single value. There are, however, reasons to exercise caution. It's important to be careful in interpreting what a frequentist probability does and does not say. In the last example, the pollster collected data from the customer base of a single car dealership over time. Based on that observation, the pollster ought to be cautious before attempting to draw inferences about customer satisfaction rates at other dealerships or attempting to draw inferences about customer satisfaction rates at the same dealership at some time in the future after, for instance, business practices might have changed. A related issue to be aware of when establishing a frequentist probability estimate is that the underlying nature of the system you collect data from must be static not just when you are drawing your inference, but also while you are collecting your data. If the conditions that define the system fluctuate wildly while you collect data, it might not be possible to determine if there even is a limit that the relative frequencies trend towards. This is illustrated in the next example. A fisheries biologist is attempting to deduce the frequentist probability that a concentration of PCBs in the tissue of tuna in a region of the North Atlantic will render it unfit for human consumption. She proposes to deduce this probability by collecting samples of tuna, testing them for PCB contamination, and computing the relative frequency of contaminated tuna in each sample. She is aware of the importance of determining the limiting value of relative frequencies as her sample size increases. So over time, she collects samples of doubling sizes starting with n equals 10. Her results are summarized in the following table. We can see our table is organized into three columns where the sample size is the first column, the number of contaminated fish within the sample is the second, and the relative frequency for contaminated fish per sample is in the third. The thing to notice about this data is that both lowercase r and capital R, the absolute frequencies and relative frequencies of contaminated fish, seem to increase for a while, but then they decrease again, and then increase and then decrease. So they're, they're not steadily trending toward a, uh, a constant value. And we're going to see that that is, uh, is even more visible in a minute on a, a graph of our data. Well, the graph that the fisheries biologist produces of the relative frequency versus the um, number of observations, the sample size, bears out the suspicions that we were possibly able to develop just by looking at the data itself. The relative frequency fluctuates wildly between nearly zero and nearly one as she increases the size of her samples. The fluctuations are very fast at first. They slow down a little bit later on. Um, but the point is, is that there is quite a bit of variability in the relative frequency measurements uh, as a function of sample size. Upshot of this is, is that we have very little hope of being able to take data like this and estimate a stable probability uh, that the um, fish in the watershed will have PCB contamination because there doesn't appear to be a stable value that the relative frequencies are trending toward. That's precisely the conclusion arrived at by the fisheries biologist. 
there seems to be no limiting value that the relative frequencies approach as the sample size increases. Therefore, the biologist concludes that from the data she collected, it is impossible to deduce a frequentist probability that any given tuna in the region will have PCB contamination at a level that is unfit for human consumption. It's possibly a little unexpected that the biologist was unable to determine a fixed estimate for the frequentist probability of a tuna being so contaminated with PCB that it would be unfit for human consumption. In situations like that, it's always worth reflecting on what the root cause could be. And so she realized in order to collect samples as large as the ones in her data set, it took the biologist several years to complete her study. Upon further investigation, she learned that while she was collecting her data, an organized crime operation had been intermittently dumping industrial waste in the North Atlantic. This waste included electronic equipment such as transformers that contained PCBs. Therefore, during some years, the fish she sampled were exposed to high levels of PCBs, and during others, they were not. In other words, the underlying environmental conditions in her study site were not even remotely static over the period of time she collected her data. This was the root cause of the excessive variability in her data. This brings us to the end of this video lesson on the frequentist interpretation of probability. Thanks for watching. If you're interested in being able to perform the calculations or construct the visualizations that appear in the examples of this video lesson, then be sure to tune in to the technological companion to this video lesson. There's a link in the description below.